Um, we're going to get started. Uh, you, this is in case uh, you don't know, it's a why you should create a web comic panel. So um, we actually do not have an official moderator for this panel. We're going to, so the inmates are kind of in charge of the asylum. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have a general outline, so I'm going to be queuing off of that. And um, we will, at the end of going through this sort of brief outline I have, we'll be opening this up for questions. So if you have any questions, um, about why you should create a webcomic or anything else you'd like to talk about. We are here to chat about that. Um, so why don't we start, Zach, why don't you talk about who you are and what you've done with webcomics. Uh, I am Zach Wienersmith. Uh, used to be Wiener, I got married. Um, and I do a comic called Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial and a number of other projects. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, yeah, that's what I do. And I'm Alex Wolfson. Um, I've done two web comics. One is for Artifice, uh, which was a science fiction story uh, with a thank you <laughs> with a, a gay android soldier. Um, and then I had a Kickstarter and turned that into this book here, which I'm selling at the con if you want to stop by. Um, and then my current web comic is The Young Protectors, which is a superhero. Oop, thank you. <laughs> which is a superhero um, comic, and that we were over 200 pages. I just posted up the latest page for that um, last night. So, uh, Zach, what is a webcomic? <laughs> Man, uh, a webcomic is a comic on the web. Uh, um, actually, I, I, have, I, have, I, I shouldn't get on this topic because I have a lot to say about it, but, but it, it's worth noting um, it, that is all that a webcomic is, but people underestimate the extent to which the distribution method for a product affects what it actually looks like. Because, like, have you ever wondered why the Sunday page comics are all banal and terrible, um, with some exceptions? Um, <clears throat> uh, it's because they're bundled with a bunch of other content, and so you're subject to the most offendable person who still reads newspapers. And uh, that's obviously not true for webcomics, so that's, that's why we can do much dirtier jokes. Uh, so, so it is just a comic on the web, but there ends up being a big difference. And it has some features, like a typical feature usually. Um, there are people who kind of put up whole chapters at a time, but it tends to be a serialized format, format of, of sharing comics. Um, that can go, come to a finish, but it, one of the advantages is that it's, a, it's something that people show up for on a continual basis, either for the bigger chunks or, in the case of my comic, um, twice a week, twice a week updates. Um, and it used to be back in the day that people would say you could only do gag strips, which again, I think was sort of a riff off what you saw in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, but at this point, I can gladly say that you can do full narrative comics, and um, it's actually a great venue to get that out there. Um, and also, um, I put up still images for mine, just like regular comic book pages, full comic book pages, but you, some people do panels, mm -hmm. and some people even do flash comics or animated comics, and so there's a, a, some people really take advantage of the multimedia aspects of the web, too. So, um, Zach, what did you try before web comics, and why did you choose to make a web comic? I actually am old enough, just barely, that long ago I applied to the major syndicates in newspapers, uh, and they all rejected me. <laughs> so that was why... I, I decided to do a webcomic because no one else would have me. Uh, but, um, but actually, nowadays, I don't think I would recommend going the print route anymore. It's too, one, it's too restrictive. But two, I don't think the money is there anymore. I, I, I don't even know. Uh, like someone, someone in webcomics did this challenge, which was, can you name someone who started paper comics in the last 10 years in the paper who's you know, Dilbert or Calvin and Hobbes level? I don't know that there are. And there must be some people who've done all right. But like, no one's like launched a megastardom, because I don't think it's there anymore, you know? Right. So, uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the main reason I did it is because I couldn't do it anywhere else. But uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's certainly the factor for me, too. I mean, the nice thing about a webcomic is that there's no gatekeepers. Um, you have access to a worldwide audience. Um, and um, for me, what I did beforehand, um, I mean, as a gay kid growing up, I loved science fiction and action stories, but I never got to see what I really wanted to see, right? which is sort of kick-ass um, genre stories that are good stories first, but with heroes who just happen to be gay. And so there's going to be some pretty strong gatekeepers if I wanted to do it with the level of production quality, which is basically I wanted it to look like the big boys. I wanted it to, to look like professional comics. Um, and so originally, um, I, when I, I went out, I hired artists. Um, I, my background is as a filmmaker. I did, released comics as PDFs, and I had a mailing list you could sign up for. Um, and what you do is sign up for the mailing list, and you get the PDF sent to you for free. And it was just that kind of exchange. And on one level, it was this huge success, because I got like 25,000 people on the mailing list in a couple of years. But then when I went to cons or out in the world, like nobody knew who the heck I was. Um, and, um, and, and, and it'd be all this celebration when I could put the individual thing out there, but then nothing would happen. 
But then, um, and I'd heard about web comics, but I always had a very negative view about them, because I'm like, I like to read satisfying chunks, and reading a page at a time felt like torture. So I was really against the idea until I went to YaoiCon a couple of years ago, or not a couple of years, I guess four years ago now, and I, heard, and I realized that the big hotness was these two web comics, Starfighter and Tea House, if you ever heard of them before. Um, and I realized I'd actually heard of them too because I had a friend of mine who had tweeted about it every single week. She would say, oh, a new update of, of Starfighter, a new update of Starfighter. And finally, after 19 times of seeing this in my Twitter, I'm like, I broke down, I'm like, okay, I'll check this out. And um, then I got hooked. And that's when I realized maybe I should be checking out these web comics for myself, for maybe from re releasing my own work. Um, so how hard do you think it is to set up a webcomic on the web? I, uh, it was hard when I started because you had to know a little about programming, uh, but now it seems like it's really easy. Like you just get a Tumblr and you have a webcomic now. Um, but then you're on Tumblr and you know, everything that comes with that. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, but, but it's really, it's, I don't know, it's really easy. There's also, there's, there's, um, you can use WordPress. There's an app or a plugin called Comic Press. Uh, do you use that? Um, I actually use webcomic. It's like two big uh, plugins. One is comic press, and the other is webcomic. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually basically no work at all uh, to set up a website these days. Yeah. And there's even other that's like dedicated sites, um, Smack Jeeves, um, yeah. all kinds. Of, there's even ones that it will set up on WordPress for you. So, you know, the it's. It's really the, like, I recommend getting your own domain name if you're a creator yourself. I think that it is very worthwhile to invest in your own domain name. Yes. And so that costs eight bucks for a year. <laughs> and then I recommend using your own hosting myself, although you don't have to, you can go with one of these other hosted solutions. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, in, particularly in the beginning when you're small, you can get a dream host account, again, for like eight bucks a month. So the, the barrier in terms of costs and also in terms of effort, very low. Yeah, oh. it's probably worth adding. Like to do it well <laughs> is is a different matter. It does it does take uh, some work to do that, and to maintain it too. I mean, I you know yeah. we'll talk about this when we get the pitfalls a little bit. But um, no, it's it, it's a lot of work. I mean, it, it's it's transitioned into essentially a full time job for me with part time pay. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, it's funny how that works. Yeah. Uh, so I don't want to minimize the amount of work of actually the creation of it, but in terms of getting your stuff out there and being able to share it with a worldwide audience. Um, the barrier to entry is very low. Yeah. Um, why are web comics especially good for building and connecting with an audience? Uh, well, mainly because you can talk with them directly, uh, and all the good and bad that comes with that. Um, yeah, it, well, it's, it's important now because it used to be if you were working for a syndicate, you had a whole set of newspapers and publicists working on your behalf, and uh, it's hard to get that these days. So you kind of have to be your own agent and publicist. Um, so, but you can do that directly. You can go into a forum and tell people you're great. Uh, so, so, in fact, you can pretend you're not you when you do it. Uh, not that I would do that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, no. It, it, you get a really personal connection, which sometimes is really terrible, but most of the time is really good. Yeah. yeah, definitely the personal connection, and, it, and it's, it's a two-way street too, because not only do the, your readers get to connect with you, but you get to connect with your readers, which is very gratifying. Because let's face it, for the vast majority of us. Um, you're, you know, I mean, nobody gets rich in comics. Like, or very, very few people get rich in comics. And, and so the, the real gratification is going to come by connecting with readers, being able to share your work and having people respond to it and maybe change some lives, which is nice when you hear back that that's happened. Um, one of the, uh, the, other, the other reasons why I think it's a really um, successful way for building an audience is sort of what happened with me with Starfighter. You, you know, you show, you show up every couple weeks, and you get people who believe in you, and then they retweet your stuff and whatever else. And just it, a lot of success in, in comics in general, and I think in web comics, is, is last person standing. Yeah, yeah. I, most people can't do it for more than six weeks. It's, it, it really is hard to, to maintain regular updates for much longer than that for most people. And many web comics just stop. You yeah. know, it's one of the reasons why I recommend a big buffer before you begin. But, yes. Yeah. You know. Many web comics just uh, stop altogether. So the showing up every week, um, the chance to have a worldwide audience for that low barrier of entry, and particularly if you're doing niche stuff, you know, um, like creating a comic about gay superheroes or, you know, what have you, because you have access to worldwide audience and there's Google and people can search terms and uh, and things like that, your chance of actually connecting with a large audience becomes realistic, and then the chance of actually um, making some money on it and at least enough money to pay your artists or to at the very least pay the hosting and then maybe even make things happen like being able to have a Kickstarter to raise money to print a book, that becomes much more realistic. Yeah. 
Um, so speaking of monetizing, yes. oh, but before we get there, let's say what are the best ways to promote your webcomic? So I'm always a little hesitant about this because I did it. I haven't done like that sort of active promotion in a long time because I, what I used to do is, is go talk to people on like Reddit and forums and things, and, and that's still valuable, I think. But there's a lot more to it now, and sort of reluctantly, I've, I've come to the conclusion that Facebook is useful. Uh, <laughs> I was. Uh, it was a really sad day for me, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you have to use, I, I really feel like you have to get used to jumping platforms regularly, you know, for a while it was MySpace, and, oh, yeah. and you know, now and I, I held out on Twitter too, and now I'm all over Twitter, and, uh, and I'm still holding out on Tumblr, but it's, it's grinding me down, it'll get me. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, um, I, I don't know the best way, but, um, but unfortunately, I think you have to do it. You have to do all these social media platforms and things. But actually, the one thing that's been consistent uh, is if you can meet your peers at your sort of level uh, of, of audience or, or skill and um, do work for them, do a guest comic or, or just cross promote. Uh, that's always been good. You know, I definitely agree with that. I mean, what, I mean certainly one of the, the least expensive ways is to get to know other webcomic creators, um, comment on their site. Don't go. Don't be too Machiavellian in the beginning, <laughs> yeah. Because people can smell that a mile away, you know. But really, I mean, develop sincere friends because that's the other one of the wonderful things that I've discovered is the great people who are involved in making webcomics. I mean, just awesome people. Um, so, the, and so there can be the cross promotion that can happen that way. Um, one thing that I'm going to put out there: there is social media, and there's Twitter, and there's, I, I myself jumped into Facebook early. I'm, a, I'm a less of a fan for the Facebook <laughs> in terms of how successful they are because they have they control so much. Yeah what people see. I mean, Tumblr, actually, because there's less of that control, I have a, a bit more of a response to. Um, although you have to do Facebook because it's the gorilla. There's a billion people on it. Yep. Yeah. It, it sucks. Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing I'm going to put out there that, you know, as, as a small guy, because I came from nowhere, I was like, nothing, um, is uh, it, if you pay. If you pay for advertising, um, that makes a big, big difference. I mean, I went, when I first started out with my webcomic, of course, I had the 25,000 people on my mailing list, yay! And I put that on my mailing list, and I got 300 people a day, which is great for a beginning thing. You know, that's great. Um, but it's, it's, it's also, on some levels, pretty small. And, and I, was, I stayed at that level until I actually advertised on Starfighter. On, yes. on the Starfighter. And then I buzzed, bumped up to 3,000 people a day. Yeah. And, Particularly if you are a creator, one um, advertising group I really strongly recommend is Project Wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I recommend it for a few reasons. One, because Ryan North, the person behind it, is also a creator and just a great human being. Yeah. Two, because it, it basically web comics is their main deal. And so your post, if you post an ad on another web comic to read your web comic for free, it's sort of a win-win for everybody. You know, you're, it's it's not like you're asking for money or anything like that. So it, it tends to, you tend to get a lot of click-throughs for less money than you would on Google Ad AdWords or anything yeah. else. And I'll give one more shout out for Project Wonderful. If you are um, someone who creates gay comics that is not totally G-rated, you will find that many advertising networks won't touch you, yep. even if your stuff isn't explicit. Um, and uh, Project Wonderful was the only web, when I first was starting out, and I had Yaoi911 in my uh, title, my URL, it was the only advertising group that would even talk to me and, let, and also let me host their ads on my site. Yeah. And so, you know. I just want to give them a shout out with that. Yeah, no, I'm, Project Wonderful is awesome. I, I, I've definitely run a lot of ads with them. And it's, it's a total buyer's market, too. You'll you get much better results there uh, than anywhere else. So monetizing a webcomic. Yeah. Um, so often, so the first place where most people go to monetize a webcomic is donations. Yeah. You'll have a little donation button on there where you can click on it, and then through PayPal, you might get uh, a little bit of money. What do you think about the monetizing webcomic through donations? So I never quite did the, that, that route. Um, I, I've heard from a lot of people that it's good. The only thing that scares me about it that I've heard anecdotally is that during like a recession, you tend to suffer more than you would if you were selling product because you're you know, asking people to donate. Uh, you're sort of, in a sense, asking for a favor. You know, I mean, you're giving them stuff in exchange for it, but it's, they don't have to do it if they want the thing. You know? And so I, I, that, I, I wonder if you're not. Um, super resilient to economic issues uh, like you are with other things. But I do now do uh, Patreon, which is essentially a glorified yeah. donation Why don't you system. talk a little bit about Patreon and what that is? Because that's a new thing. Yeah, right. so it's a new thing. Uh, I, I just got into it, uh, I guess, early this year. And the basic idea is you do something, and a bunch of people agree in exchange that whenever you do that something, they give you X amount of money. So it might be 50 cents. It might be uh, $100, because they're crazy people, and uh, <laughs> who I love. and. Uh, <laughs> 
and uh, and, and, and monthly. It's like a monthly oh, yeah. commitment. Monthly. Well, but it doesn't have to be. That's the oh. cool thing. So for most comics people, it's monthly because the thing the thing you do is monthly comics. But you can't. I think Jack Conte, who founded it, just said, "Anytime I make a music video, you agree to pay me for it." It, it doesn't work so well for comics because I could be like, "Well, I'm going to make 100 comics this month," <laughs> you know, uh, and and keep charging you for it. Uh, but um, but yeah, it's great because it regularizes income. Uh, nothing else for me is as regular as Patreon. Like Patreon, uh, the, the the amount of variance isn't isn't more than five or ten percent, and the variance is always positive. Whereas in merchandise, it's variable in general and high z highly seasonal which is really hard to deal with if you don't know what you're doing because you make a bunch of money around Christmas and you think you're rich and then it's January and you're poor. Um, so you, you have to you know, exercise discretion, which is hard. And, um, and it's the same with advertising too, very seasonal, very, very difficult uh, in the early months of the year, whereas Patreon is nice and smooth, and, and which is really important if you want to hire people to do things and know that you can keep paying them. Um, so yeah, Patreon, I love it. Everyone, everyone should use Patreon. Yeah. Um, and for me, with, with, with donations, um, I myself am somebody who, who believes, who doesn't really believe in a free lunch, who doesn't, yeah. who doesn't believe in, in donations just for donations' sake necessarily. Um, not because I don't think they're wonderful, and I, and I do sometimes do that myself. I will donate for other web comics that I just believe in, but I just am skeptical about whether anybody would ever do that for me. <laughs> um, and so what I, what I, I actually had a really good reader suggestion early on where um, I put a donation bar up because everyone puts a, a, or a donation button up because everybody does that. But then a reader suggested, "Hey, look, why don't you put a donation bar, and when you hit a certain target, um, you put up an extra page for that week?" Um, and I thought, "Well, this is great because I have 50 pages in my buffer because I was a really, I really wanted to make sure I had a big buffer because I didn't want to be one of these comics that flaked out." Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the, I put that up there and made it and made it $200 because I wanted it to be a big special event. So every $200 will. We'll do that, and so you know, after three months, we hit that two hundred dollars. Yay! Put up a second page for that week, all excitement. Then it was a month and a half after that we hit it again. Okay, yay! Um, and then it was uh, every. Then it was three weeks later. Then a week and a half, and then it was. Then we hit the yeah. sex scene. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was every week through the whole rest of Artif whole rest of the artifice comic. At that. <laughs> so. Um, and then, uh, then for the Young Protectors, which is the new comic, I bumped it up to 400 because I was working with two artists. And yeah. I mean, even 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 at 400 dollars, none of that winds in my pocket, but it does offset the amount that I pay for my artists, which is very helpful. Um, and that again uh, started off again a little pokey, um, but we just celebrated our full year of bonus pages. Every week, there's been 400 dollars that's come in with that. That's awesome. So. Thank you. Um, so it's, it's sort of the freemium model, you know, where no matter yeah. what, every week I put up a page for free, you know, and I make that very clear. And I also make it very clear that I don't create extra pages for the, for bon to try to get bonus content up there. It, this is a page that we posted up on Saturday no matter what. But it is something to be thinking about, like when you are thinking about any kind of things, monetization, what are you offering in exchange? Um, and so that's one reason why I think that's successful. And I would myself consider Patreon, but I'm already getting, um, yeah. you know, $1,600 a month just from the donation bars, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and going on a Patreon, and I'm, I'm kind of at my limit with my Kickstarter rewards that I'm putting up that I just, I just don't have any more bandwidth to <laughs> honorably take on any more commitments. Yeah. In, so. yeah. All right, well, we talk a little bit about advertising. You talked a little bit about that. What, how, sure. how about monetizing a comic through advertising? Yeah, um, so I'll tell you the good and bad, in my opinion, about advertising. The, the, the good thing is it's one of the better sources of income uh, on the web, uh, and, and it's it's like no strings attached money, generally speaking, which is nice. Like merchandise is good money, but you got to work. Uh, you got to do something, um, and 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 you have to have infrastructure. You know, you have you have to put that stuff somewhere. You know, and or you have to have someone putting it somewhere for you. Uh, advertising, you just get a check at the end of the month, which is great. Uh, the downside is you lose a little control of your website, which can be really bad at times. Um, sometimes people put up stuff you don't like. Uh, sometimes people. Um, uh, throw uh, viruses through your website. I've had that a couple times, uh, and that's a good way to make readers unhappy. <laughs> um, so uh, it, I, I definitely recommend it. It's a good way to make revenue, but you you do have to watch it. it you have to be careful because you, you're giving up a decent amount of control. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I think you should have I think you should have advertising on your site just because why not? It can be a few cents every day, or sometimes it could be more. But you need a certain critical mass of readers before it becomes anything that's more than just paying for your web hosting the 20 bucks a month. I am at the low end of, of being successful, you know, so that I, I, I bring in, you know, I'll open the kimono here, you know, I bring in a, 
if I'm, if I'm a good month, about $1,000 a month with advertising, which is real money. And yeah. I'm, I'm not going to poo-poo that at all. It's not enough to live off of. And, I, and comics that have, have more readership than mine are obviously able to make their living off of the advertising. Um, the issues are, of course, uh, the ones that pay the most are the mainstream ones. And like I said, if you're doing a gay comic that is anything more than G-rated, they're not going to they'll, they'll, yeah. they'll say thank you, no thank you. Um, even even some other, like there's another ad network out there that does web comics. It's not Project Wonderful, that I love the people behind it. And they courted me to put ads on my site, and then they read the, the comic, <laughs> I guess, or I don't know what happened there, but they then realized that their mainstream advertisers wouldn't yeah. say yes to that. So um, that's an issue. And, and yes, and then there is, you lose some control of the content. You, should, you can still shut ads down. You often be able to turn it off with a click. But I just had this issue this week where you know, I opened up some ads under the fold for adult ads that um, were more explicit. And it, as a, on a political level, you know, I, I, even though my comic is R-rated and I don't show that stuff for my own comic, on a political level, you know, I, do, I do kind of want to support other people who are yeah. show, realizing their vision and doing it in a tasteful way. And, um, and uh, this, this advertiser has been posting on my thing for a long time. He's a reliable advertiser. And he started posting up more explicit ads over the past few days. And I had a reader revolt over it, yeah. where they said, I like this comic, but not enough to keep coming to this site where I see these ads. Yeah. So it is, it, that, that level of control is something. It does mean, it meant this morning when I wanted to rush, <laughs> not rush, when I wanted to get here in a timely manner for the <laughs> convention, I had to do a whole bunch of stuff, yep. site management stuff on my site um, in order to make sure those ads weren't there so that my readers weren't having a rough time. So. Yeah. How about merchandise? Oh man, I, I held out against doing merchandise for a long time because it's a lot of work, but um, it's one of the best revenue streams. Uh, and it's actually, like t-shirts are really good money, but they're the worst pain in the ass because you've got to carry like, I, I think we carry at this point 13 sizes for every shirt because you have mm -hmm. a, you know, a unisex and female cut and then you go all the way from small to triple X and it just, you know, you have to stock all of this stuff and you don't know how it's going to sell. I was like, we had a shirt design that I thought was great that we released last year, and I think we still have like 300 of them. I think we're gonna live in them or something. <laughs> um, so I, it, it's tough, you have to lay out money in advance, but it's actually, at this point for us, it's good business um, to do, and I'm talking about just ancillary merchandise, not the book itself. Uh, it's good for us because the risk you take, I think for a full order of most of the stuff we do is not more than say $2,000, which is a risk, but it's not like a break your back risk. And, and we usually come out profitable, so. You have to do it, I mean, but at this point I actually hire someone pretty much full-time to handle it uh, because, uh, what? I mean, talk a little bit about that to, to handle, like how do you, do you work with, you said you work with Bread Pig? I think yeah, yeah, they, they don't handle that merchandise, but I, I, I do have someone, just a friend of mine who essentially runs a small warehouse, uh, and it's, for me, like, it's important because I need to free up my time to make more stuff, and so it, it reached a point where it was worth it for me to, to pay her on, on the regular to, uh, to handle the shipping, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, for me, I'm, I'm kind of a merchandise virgin. That's like, there's things that are, that are you'll find it, as a creator, there's some things that are totally in your bailiwick and they're really easy and straightforward. And, and, and one of those things for me is interacting with the readers. I love that kind of stuff and I get a lot of energy from that. On the farthest extreme is coming up with products to sell. That is, I mean, that's hard for me. It's no fun. Yeah, it, it's really, it, it, it's hard to describe, but it's very hard to come up with something people will buy. Like, you can come up with stuff... Like, I had this shirt uh, a while back that was this dumb joke about aliens, and I thought it was hilarious. And I actually had a bunch of people tell me it was really funny, but nobody actually wanted to wear it. Right. Like, there's a, there's a difference between that's funny and I want to wear it. Because, like, like, in t-shirts, for example, like, what you really want is a shirt, I think, that says something about the wearer. It doesn't have to be funny, it doesn't even have to be good, it just has to say something that the wearer would like their friends to know about them, you know? And that's really hard to do in a novel way. So, I suck at it, too. <laughs> uh, we should have had, had Malky, he's here somewhere, he's really good <laughs> he's at exactly it. exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm getting more into it. I mean, I, you know, as Zach was suggesting, I mean, the book is often not considered merchandise, it's, right. you know, but really the book is going to be your, the, where you're going to make most of your money. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, that is, it's, it's, it's the best, in terms of, like, the cost, like, a T-shirt can be an expensive thing to make, mm -hmm. um, and then you only are going to be able to charge so much for it, whereas a book yep. it, is not totally inexpensive, but the, the profit margins are a bit higher. Way better, yeah. And people want them. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so uh, that's sort of a, a, pro a working, kind of a, something that's in a, an evolution for me. 
this is an area, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, is, is where Kickstarter is a really helpful thing where you can kind of float some things out there yeah. and, and be able to create merchandise with no risk, and that's where I'm kind of learning the stuff. That's where I'm getting my education. Okay, well, this is the stuff that people actually want as opposed to what I think they might want. Mm -hmm. um, and here's what doesn't work, and, and in that way, that's very good. So why, you know, with these web comics are so great, why would you still want to create a print, printed book? We kind of gave away the... Oh, yeah. Well, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mainly, well, it's, it's the profit margin. I, I mean, I, let's, let's be honest, like, if people didn't buy them for the rate they buy them for, I wouldn't sell them, because um, uh, I like money. Uh, but, uh, but no, it's, well, it's partially just because of how the market works, but also, I mean, it is a lot of work to make a book. It's certainly a lot more work to make a book than a shirt, but, like... You know, if you do a big enough print run, a book might cost you a dollar a piece to make, and you can the, the market agrees that a book is worth twenty dollars, whereas a shirt they also agree is worth twenty dollars, but it might run you seven or eight dollars right. to make. So, and you have to store it, which actually costs money too. So, the profit margin is substantially better on anything printed, and also people really like to buy books, and also you only have to stock one book right. as opposed to twelve <laughs> sizes right, of book for different people who want. I don't. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, books are amazing, but the downside is, of course, you have to make them, uh, which is much more difficult. Actually, it's probably a lot more difficult than you imagine. You have this idea, I think I, even, I still do this when we do a new book. I'm like, well, we'll just put comics in it, and then there'll be a book. And it's just never that simple. There's always other stuff to do. And, uh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of different levels to that. I mean, I, I, I think, yep, definitely, you know, I, I didn't realize this was going to be the big seller, so I was a little foolish in that. I mean, into, I didn't necessarily have that understanding beforehand, but that's definitely a good reason why you should do that. I mean, also, I just love books, and I think yeah. that is like that. Totally. And I wanted it hardcover, and, it, um, and, and able to make that. And I, I just think it's a more pleasant reading experience. And this is one of the reasons why, um, why, it's, it, why printing a book from a webcomic is a really successful Kickstarter goal, because what you're doing there is it's, it's again the freemium model where you're giving something away for free that's perfectly good and perfectly valid, which is the webcomic. People can read the whole thing for free online. But it's more pleasant to read it in book form and to have the artifact of the book and maybe some special features and whatever else in it. And so for that extra, pre if you want that, then you pay the extra premium of what the actual book is. So it's yeah. kind of a really, it's sort of the, the, the perfect kind of model where you're able to give your whole product away for free and yet people still want to pay you yep. at the end of it. It's a pretty good deal, yeah. Um, one thing I'll say, if you are a webcomic creator, you should be thinking about going to print from the start, which means learning about things like the difference between CMYK and RGB. Yep. You know, uh, CM RGB, of course, is, is red, green, blue pixels on your screen. It's what computers use. It's not what printers use for ink. Printers use um, CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and K for black. Um, <laughs> black <laughs> at that point. Um, and if you start an RGB and want to convert to CMYK, it's possible, but it's a, it can be a painful process. Yep. Yeah, well, the other thing is to consider your panel sizes. Yes. Because if you have irregular sized comics like mine, you have to get a little creative uh, when you're making the book. Um, so yeah, if you can do a regular shape and size, almost yeah. any regular shape and size, but some regularity would be, would be smart. And, and that can become a, a totally serious. I mean, you know, I wanted an eight and a half by 11 inch book. I wanted the big book. I wanted to see the art big in it. I was really proud of my stuff. And, I, I wanted that experience. If nobody else was going to read this, I was going to read it, and I was going to get the book I wanted. And then, you know, when I brought this to Diamond Distributors, which is sort of the only way you can distribute comics to comic book stores yep. in the United States, they said, yeah, that's great, but we won't distribute an 8.5 by 11 inch book. Yep. If it's not standard comic book size, and you're not, say, DC or <laughs> anything else, yeah. we're just not going to bother taking you on. And so yep. this is one of the things, if you are planning on creating a book, Check out the technical specs, and then go to your local retailer or wherever you're thinking you're planning on selling it, and talk to the people there about what you're planning on doing. Like, if you're planning on doing an off-size, yeah. don't do it unless you really, it's the only way you're going to be happy. Um, and get that information. So before, if you do that all ahead of time, it's all gravy and easy. Yeah. If you don't do it ahead of time, it's a world of pain. It's a world of pain. Oh, and make sure to save your files large. Some oh. people don't do that, and oh my god. <laughs> yeah. And backup, 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 backup oh, yeah. in the cloud, backup locally. Um, back up. Should we go straight to audience questions? We're uh, getting. Yeah. When did Because yeah. we talked about Kickstarter yesterday. Yeah, we did. Okay. Yeah. So um, op opening up to questions. Whoa. Uh, just, what were the contents, the contents? I mean, like, yeah, is, is the nature of your question, like, whether monetization is affecting the content of the comic? Or, uh, to, to an extent, it has to. Um, I mean, you're in kind of a different universe than I am, but, like, 
I can't show nudity in my comic. I would love to, but my, I, my, I mean, I bet they wouldn't notice, but my advertisers, my contract with them says no, no nipples. Uh, it, I don't know if it, it might actually literally say that, I don't know. Um, but, uh, so I can't, and it really sucks when you ha do a sex scene and you have to have the woman going like this, you know? And, and um, but so that is affected. Uh, I'd like to think not much more than that. Uh, like I don't, for example, I don't write a comic in order to sell a t-shirt. Like I, I don't do that. If, if, if it happens to work that way, that's awesome, but I, I absolutely don't do that. Um, I have friends who do that though. I don't, I don't have a problem with it, but it's just not my style. Um, I would like to think it hasn't strongly affected me, but th there are some, some social rules you have to follow if you want to run ads uh, is the one thing for sure. I would like to be that smart. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I actually have this because you know, I, I do know comics that have success with this. I actually am thinking like, well, maybe for the next one, I'll have like an artifact that they have to all hunt for and there'll, there'll be different flavors of it and that yeah. could be monetized. But I, you know, it's usually, it's like I, I create the stuff and I'm like, gosh, what am I gonna do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I think that's good. I don't know, I don't, you don't wanna be too, yeah. Yep. Almost every other book that mm. So it's kind of strange. There seems to be a dichotomy between what ads are allowed on PG comics versus more adult comics. Mm. I don't know if you've ever seen a difference between the two of your ads. If you if you frequent more adult comics or more adult sites on that, you know, if that changes your ads or not, or if you, you know if your readers have been influenced by that. I I don't know. I, I mean, as far as I know, I mean, I, I mean, as I said, I just use Project Wonderful exclusively, yeah. um, and I do not believe they use any cookie tracking like that. I can say that from my experience of using it, I get to choose what rating of ads I want, and so I did. Like I said, I had those adult ads for a couple of weeks, and now they're you know, now it's bound to not safe for work, which really is PG thirteen. Like they have yeah. a very Project Wonderful is a pretty like their adult is not supposed to. Supposed to be that explicit, and anyway, so I have that level of control. But really, what I notice in terms of the ads that show up on my site, some people are, you know, if you have a if you have a gay comic and you advertise on my site, people are going to click through, and so those tend to be the ads that yeah. show up. That it's it's becomes a sort of self-selecting thing. Yeah. I've heard of uh, users complaining, "Oh, your ads are offending me." Like, well, based on your serving habits. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good point. I'm going to say that next time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. The, so the problem is, so in, the way Project Wonderful works is it's you pay for time, so there's no need for cookie tracking. Um, I, I don't want to get too into the thick of it, but like, so the way most of my ads work, I also use Project Wonderful, but my above the fold ads, we basically work with a third party who might work with fourth, fifth, or sixth parties, and they serve ads up. And so we have control, and then I can say, don't do X, Y, Z. But at this point, we're serving over a million a day, and so stuff slips through. So I'll get an email on them that's like, there's an ad on your site selling Russian brides. Are you okay with that? And, and maybe now I'll just say, well, it's your surfing habits. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, mazel tov, good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, as a writer, how do you make your connections with artists or like websites or movies that you recommend or ways to do that or vice versa as an artist or writer? Um, well, I'll talk briefly about this, uh, but I'll say, first of all, if you go to my site and you click on email Alex, and I have some articles I've written about this, but the, um, and I'm happy to send them out to anybody who wants to see them. Uh, the short answer is um, I post online and on artist forums, like there's artist for hire forums, and I have open calls, um, and, um, and I offer money, which puts me ahead of 90% of everybody else out there. 99%. 99%. Yeah. <laughs> and and I've, you know, this is the kind of person I am and what I believe in, I'm very transparent. I'm like, here is what the page rate, here's what my expectations are, here's what I will pay per page. And it is not what Marvel and DC can pay, but it's not, it's not small for independent comics. And so, you know, I just had a recent thing right now where I put up another open call for uh, art for my trading cards that are coming out for the Kickstarter. And um, I got 450 applications. And you know, and then out of that, maybe a hundred, I followed up by looking through their portfolio, and then out of that, you know, but that's basically the short answer is you put an open call, you, get, you are very explicit in terms of what your expectations are and what you're offering, but you don't play any games, um, and then you can have some really good success that way. Yeah, it's, uh, if you were a, an, a writer who hasn't really started on your career yet and you're trying to get an artist, it's practically impossible to get someone good. You might get very lucky, 
but unless you're paying, you don't you don't really have a relationship. You don't have any leverage with your person, and, and I would say probably nine times out of ten, your person will flake on you if you're not paying for work. I mean, unless you bring something else to the table, but a, you know, like a, some sort of a reputation pre-existing. But the hardest position to be in is a writer who wants to write and doesn't have an artist. It's a uh, it's hard. Uh, if, you, if you could learn to draw, that might help. I don't know, but uh, I mean, I, and and it's it's worth doing too. Uh, you know, you start now. I mean, I'm still terrible, but I'm less terrible than I was ten years ago. So, if you could, is, that, is, that, is that the kind of question you want to? Oh, you're an artist. Oh, you need a writer. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> well. That's a totally different question. Uh, I hate to say it because it's you know it's like the opposite question. Yeah. Everybody wants an artist, um, yeah. so you just look, I, I mean let's like pragmatically you're looking to find a writer to write for you or what are you looking yeah, for? I mean, I'm just looking for I guess an interesting story. Well then you you are going to be the bell of the ball, sir. Yeah. Um, you're... <laughs> I mean I I mean the one thing I would say is I would say you know have re, I mean and this Zach can probably speak more about this as an artist than I can, but. You know, respect yourself in that you don't, you know, charge a reasonable rate for what yeah. you're, for your work, and 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 then be totally professional. And most, I mean, many, you've got the production triangle. Are they reliable? Are they pleasant to work with? And do they create good art? Yeah. If you hit, hit two of those, you you can work for the rest of your life. Totally. No, that's absolutely <laughs> true. Yeah. It, yeah. And so, but in terms of sites, I'll just quickly say conceptart.org, digital webbing, um, and gutter zombie. Those are the places where I post because mm -hmm. that's um, where I tend to get the best quality artists. Conceptart.org. Um, that's where I get the highest quality artists, to be honest. That's where I have the best success. Digital webbing. I've had good success with them, particularly with artists from around the world. Um, and then gutter zombie if you're a colorist or a flatter. Mm. So. A flatter is somebody who prepares pages for coloring. It, it tends to be drudge work, and so colorists prefer to have somebody else do it, somebody just starting out, yeah. usually. Flats like flat colors in the, yeah. <laughs> I think there was a question back there. <laughs> oh, see, we both write more, so we're kind of... <laughs> um, uh, well, I would say this. For, for, to get people to look at your webcomic, the art is more important. To get people to stick with your webcomic, I think the writing is more important. Yeah. That's, that's, very, that's a flip answer, but I think that would be my real answer to that. Yeah, that's, I think that's... Like, it's hard to think of a comic that people love that is just beautiful but doesn't really have a story. I can... Think of one or two, but I won't say <laughs> what they are. But like, but but even then, like the, the the comics that do really well are the ones with good writing. And it, like, I mean, the most popular comics right now are like XKCD and The Oatmeal and Saturday Night and Happiness. And like, I mean, for what they do, they do it well. But it's not like the Mona Lisa over there. <laughs> um, and uh, so yeah, I do think. I mean, the the big success is in being a good writer. But on the other hand, the, the flip side of that is, if you're a good artist, you'll always have work. Uh, you 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 might not become a you know a super famous trillionaire. You might, but it's it's harder. But but yeah, the work will always be there for you. Which if you're a writer, forget it. You got to make it for yourself. You know, but good art definitely gives you street cred. Yeah. You know, like people when they come to my website, they're willing to give it that extra chance because the quality of art is high, and so. And then hopefully the writing is enough to hook them to keep them on the long term. Yeah, that's actually with the Kickstarter I just did. It was the first time um, I did a Kickstarter with an artist because um, previously I'd done it all myself, and I think his work really helped sell us. I mean, he had an audience he brought with him, but he also just does beautiful work, and I think people see that and they don't know you, and they say, "I'll pay twenty bucks for that," you know. So a picture is worth a thousand words. Yes, you know? or twenty bucks. Or twenty bucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, right up front here. Uh, I don't think it matters, uh, to be honest. I, I actually, uh, I, I, do, I do live stream occasionally, but the main reason I do that is because it, I can't check Reddit if I'm live drawing. Uh, I guess I could, but I don't know. People, people would know my habits then. Uh, but uh, but I, uh, I actually have been surprised uh, from a creator standpoint. Like when I did Patreon, I was like, oh, I'm going to have to offer a lot of stuff. But I, I, I mean, we just had a kid. I don't have time for, to, to really offer a lot more. So we just did really minimal stuff. Um, and actually now I think if I had to do over, I probably would have offered even less. Because uh, most because I've been surprised. Like one of my offerings was if you give, I think it's either five or ten dollars a month. I think five dollars a month. Uh, I do a, a sort of request. Like that group only gets a draw by request session with me. Last time I did it, literally no one showed up, um, which you may think is sad, but was great for me. <laughs> 
but so I was surprised because I mean, this is there are people shelling out. I mean, it's not a lot of money, but five dollars a month it's something, you know. And but most people, I, I, what I've come to realize is they just want to support you uh, through Patreon. So I, I don't know if you're looking to use Patreon, but I, my, the advice I've been giving is, you know, make people feel like they're helping you out, but you don't don't break your back over it. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll just say ditto to that. <laughs> uh, over here. Uh, you did it as a movie theater and did a lot of uh, movie sketches. Mm -hmm. um, like, how different is that process from like writing for the comic? Uh, totally different. I um, I used to work the last one of the last real jobs I ever worked was I worked for talent agents and I did script coverage. I read scripts and reported on them, like whether they were good or bad. And the worst screenplay writers, uh, especially of comedy, were stand-up comedians because they didn't think they had to learn anything new to write a comic. So if you've ever seen a really bad comic, there's a good chance it was written by a stand-up comedian, especially if it made no sense at all. It was probably written by like a stand-up or someone from SNL or something. I mean, I actually think that's why if you look at an SNL movie, the reason they're like, they don't make any damn sense <laughs> is because they're written by people who write sketches who probably don't think they have anything to learn. Um, so I tried to, when we were doing it, approach it as if it was totally new. Um, and it really is, because like, the stuff you can do in comics that you can't do in video and vice versa, and you work in video, you know this. Like, yeah. in, in comedy you can get a laugh off of someone's reaction to something. And you can kind of do that in comics, but it's, it's not really the same. You know, there's, there's, when you have a real life human face, a lot of stuff gets easier. A lot of stuff gets harder too though, because you can't, in comics you can pick exactly what a scene yeah. looks like, and when it doesn't look right the first time, you're like, oh, I'll change that eyebrow, how's that, you know? You cannot do that in video, not, not cheap anyway. Uh, not, at, not at our level, uh, but uh, yeah. And you get an unlimited special effects budget with comics, which is... Yeah, exactly. If, if you're doing like science fiction or superheroes, is it something that helps, so... Yeah, no, I would, one piece of advice I try to give is anytime you're changing what kind of writing you're doing, no matter how small a change it feels like, start, start over it. Presume yourself to be an idiot and start learning like as if you don't know a thing. Um, I mean, what, what you know previously will help you a little bit. It's kind of like if you were a good 2D artist, it'll probably help you sculpt but it won't help you that much. Um, yeah. Yep, and the way you learn is by creating. So if you are yeah. tempted at all to do this, start writing those scripts. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, don't hesitate, hop in. Yeah. Especially yeah. because like, we, we probably should have mentioned this earlier, like if you start a comic, it's a snowballing process. It's a very slow process of, of uh, accrual of yeah. audience. So yeah. it, the more you wait, the, the longer you're delaying yourself. It'll, it'll take you years to get enough audience to do it for a living. So start, start soon. Yep. Um, I've been surprised about how effective promoting at cons uh, is. I, w I went in with very low expectations, but it is, I mean, the real way to promote it at a con is when you have a book and you hand it out, and once you have your first book out, that does make a big difference. I mean, it, it builds a snowball, but um, I think that it's great. It, it, in some levels, it's a good way to promote um, and to get yourself known to a, a people who would never otherwise see it, but I also will say this one other thing. Sometimes the streams don't meet. Like, there's the online yeah. world, and then there's the real world. And people, and a lot of people who like reading Dead Tree editions don't want to come anywhere near web comics. I would have been one of those people until I discovered that I liked them. <laughs> um, and a lot of people, it, it, and, but people will like web comics, will then buy your book. So that's, that is one of those things I'll just put out there, that it's not the best way to promote a web comic, necessarily. Yeah, it, 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 it's interesting, because we were just talking about this before we came in here, like, so you're a more gregarious uh, social person than I am. <laughs> Uh, so that means cons are probably more enjoyable for you than they are for me, but also you probably do better. You're probably better at pulling people from an audience and getting them to buy your book than I am, because I'm over here like, hey, you don't want this. <laughs> I suck, you know? Um, but so I, I actually, I mean, it's, it's a little silly, but it is true to like, consider what you are like um, in life, because if, if you're like Malky, he's out there, he's probably selling a million books right now. Like, he loves talking to people, he loves promoting his product, and he does pretty well. He can also handle talking to 400 people a day. Uh, for me, I, I don't like it very much. This is actually the only con I'm doing this year. I'm, I'm kind of pulling out of cons. Uh, and it, it's, your gregariousness is actually a financial issue for you when you go to cons. Uh, if you're the kind of person who's gonna glad hand and make a whole bunch of connections, you should go because it will improve your financial status. But if you're kind of awkward uh, and maybe red-haired, I don't know, uh, <laughs> people aren't gonna, it, we, we do okay, but, but you should also, you should look at the numbers. Like, this is the first year I'm not doing San Diego. Uh, I don't know, did you do San Diego? I did a San Diego last year, and 
if you're gonna do if you're gonna do if you're gonna do San Diego and you're you're a gay person LGBT sorry queer I mean let me make that even more inclusive um, then you should do go with Prism and there's a lot of reasons for that we don't yeah, have time to get into prism. that but but yes yeah so I I did the calculation uh, for us to just exist at San Diego yeah. and to have a mm -hmm. little booth space and go have hotel rooms, food, because they gouge you like hell there. I think I estimate, oh, and to have your merchandise printed and there is between, say, seven and $10,000. Um, and, yeah. and, and we weren't like, we weren't going all out either. I mean, if we had, like, Prism's booth, it's probably a lot more than that. I don't know what they spend, but, yeah. but uh, so it costs a lot to, to be there and to do business. So, you know, that means if you sell Ten thousand dollars worth of merchandise, you are at zero dollars. Actually, you're in a sense you're actually yep. worse than zero dollars because you lost a, a week to prep and a week to being there and probably a week to gaining your sanity back after and, and recover from the flu that you got there too. So. Literally, that is true. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so for me, uh, at, at this point in my career, for me, I don't think it even makes sense to be there. Although I, I, I have friends who are encouraging me because I think it is good business and I make good connections, but like. So to put that in perspective, for me, a really good t-shirt design over its run is worth more than $10,000. Um, so if I spent that three weeks like sitting in a lounge chair thinking up t-shirt ideas, uh, it would at least pay better. Uh, I wouldn't make any connections in my lounge chair. I don't know, maybe somebody would come by. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, but to be fair though, part of why I can say that is because I'm a little advanced in my career, so I have all the connections I need for the next 20, 30 projects. Um, so you should definitely do it, but be mindful of how much it's costing you and, and whether you're the kind of person who can hack it at those sort of things. Yep, and connections, that really is the big deal, deal yeah. for me. It, it was a chance to meet, I went to this webcomic rampage in Texas yeah, and yeah, got yeah. to meet Malky and got to meet you know, a bunch of people. You know, and I, you, know, you can reach to people online, but face to face, whether you know, gregarious or not, I mean, it, is, it can be a deeper connection. And yep. so meeting other, cre I mean, it's great to meet your readers, and I, I get a lot of energy from that and a lot of happiness. But even just uh, meeting other creators, you know, I, at the very first con I ever went to, which, you know, when I went to Yowie Con, when I had my webcomic out, the, the, there's a webcomic called Tea House, which is a uh, Yowie comic. One of the Tea House ladies grabbed me, pulled me aside, <laughs> said, you, come here. <laughs> And talked to me for 45 minutes about merchandising. I knew nothing about merchandising before that. And she, it was like a master's class because she's just, they're geniuses yeah. with merchandising. So for the connections part, I wouldn't minimize that, particularly when you're just starting out. Oh, it yeah. can make a big difference. Yeah, no, I actually, I credit a lot of my success to going to San Diego. Oh, what is it? What does this one mean? I have one minute? One minute. We got one minute. All right. Uh, let's do Speed any round. questions. <laughs> we have a really good question. Yes. <laughs> Uh, well, if, if you want to do physics jokes, uh, um, th that audience is there, although I will say like, it helps to do dailies, because if you do a joke about Stokes Law today, which nobody <laughs> here, yeah, um, uh, if no one laughs, like nobody laughed when I said Stokes Law, um, tomorrow you can replace it with a butt joke. And, <laughs> and, and, and I mean that seriously, though. Like, like, the more niche you want to be, the more it pays to do regular content, so you can kind of build a coalition instead of having to, to please people. But but I will say, and we got to get out of here. But um, the more niche you are, the smaller your audience you have, but the more you can charge for products and uh, advertising. So, well, as as you, you know, uh, right. Yeah. And the one thing I would say, and then we'll just close on on this, is that again, in terms of your prepping a web comic, as painful as it is, as it is to come up with like a two sentence or three sentence thing that sums up both what your comic is about and who you think the audience is for it. Um, be thinking about that ahead of time and be thinking about that constantly as you're doing it. And then the nice thing about a webcomic is you can actually find out who your audience is. Yeah. And you might be surprised yeah. by that. So. Yeah, don't write for an audience you don't want because then you'll have to deal with them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone.